Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor Series sponsored by MRI Education Foundation and ProScan. Today we're going to talk about acute injuries of the hip. This will be the last in our initial series of vignettes on the hip, which as I've mentioned on many occasions is one of the most challenging joints. Let's start out with acute traumatic injuries, including dislocations and fractures. Please, please approach these as you would approach any conventional radiograph or CAT scan. Use these same skills to decide if you're injured, your fracture is displaced, angled, gapped, rotated. Describe the fragments relative to the distal fracture fragments when it comes to angulation because this is the radiographic convention. If there is a dislocation, expect to see a hill sacs type of bruise or fracture. Expect to see something similar to a bankert in the shoulder. Expect to describe a quadrant of dislocation, which is usually posterior. Expect to decide whether the hip is now back in the joint or not. A very important prognostic factor. Anytime you have an injury to the femur, you should always attempt to decide whether the injury lies above the reflection of the capsule and joint or below it. In other words, is it intraarticular or extraarticular? Does it sit above the zona abicularis, which is defined in vignette number nine, the reflection of the capsule inferiorly, everything above it is intraarticular, everything below it is extraarticular. And you should define your fracture relative to the head or the capital portion of the femur, the neck, and the trochanter. You can even divide the trochanter up further into upper or supra trochanteric, inter trochanteric, and sub trochanteric. Acute injuries should cause a search for labral pathology. One should look for avulsions of key apophyseal structures like the anterior inferior iliac spine or the posterior superior iliac spine. And again, I mentioned this twice for a good reason. Is the head in the cup when you see it on imaging or is it still out? The number one factor in determining whether the head crumbles due to vascular insufficiency after a dislocation is how long the head is out of the joint. The number two status determining whether the head survives or not is whether the fracture is intraarticular above the zona abicularis. If it's above the zona abicularis, this is a poorer prognostic sign. Two other caveats. We've already talked about some of the rules in assessing fractures, but the two other caveats are, don't forget to look at the physis. Physial fractures are commonly missed on MRI. They present as areas of physial widening in the setting of acute trauma. You can also get physial widening due to indirect trauma, repetitive low-grade trauma, but that is a story for another day. So the history will be very helpful to you, namely the history of an acute event. Beware of one particular diagnosis that may mimic acute joint injuries, physial abnormalities, and even femoral acetabular impingement, and that is the cortical intraarticular osteoid osteoma, which may generate an effusion, but may also produce little or no intramedullary or endosteal osteoedema. Let's take the classic acute joint injury. In other words, the classic hip dislocation. These are almost always posterior. The reason they're not anterior is because you have this 
tremendous guardian, this protective agent that sits in your buttocks. Yes, it's your buttocks that prevents you from dislocating anteriorly. It's a pad. The structures anteriorly are much thinner. So a blow to the front of the hip may force the femur out the back and result in an acetabular rupture or a posterior labral column fracture. Because this area is relatively vascular, as long as the separation is not exuberant, and as long as the rotation of the acetabulum is not profound, these patients will heal up relatively well. It is common to see a contusion in the anteromedial aspect of the femoral head, just as you would see a contusion in a posterior dislocation in the shoulder, and call that a reverse hill sacs equivalent. Do not confuse this contusion with an impending avascular necrosis, because very few people who dislocate their hip and relocate it spontaneously ever get a vascular necrosis of the hip. Let's demonstrate a real hip injury by evaluating the biomechanics of the hip injury following the kickoff in a professional football game. The player has retrieved the ball off the ground. He's tackled, and you'll see very little initially until we show it in slow motion. But notice the way he falls. Notice that the knee strikes the ground, but not directly. There is some rotation during the strike, and his body is also twisting at the same time. Twisting of the torso and also slight progressive external rotation of the knee as the knee strikes the ground. Watch it very carefully right here. You can see his foot is even deviated out to the side. Watch his right foot right now. You're going to see the right foot deviate there. That tells you you have some external rotation. Now, it doesn't really look like much, does it? You know, the knee is striking an inanimate object called the earth. And what has happened? Here's his coronal T1 fat-weighted image, his proton density water-weighted image, and his T2 fat-suppressed image, which is a little better for ligaments but not as good for the labrum. The labrum is macerated but not completely torn off. There's a little tag of it that still remains attached. The rest of this ragged high signal intensity represents tear. He could not walk. He had pain. He had a severe click. He had two choices, operation or healing. He knew that an operation carried with it the risk of contractile fibrosis and the inability to rotate his hips very flexibly, which he needed for his position, which included running back, wide receiver, and kickoff returner. He was a very versatile player. So hip rotation was essential. He chose the conservative route. He went out and played a year later in summer training camp. And for two days, he played well and was pain-free. But on the third day, he started to feel a little click. On the fourth day, pain. On the fifth day, loss of function. And that was it. That was the end of his career. He did have the procedure after that. He had a arthroscopic labral repair, but never recovered the flexibility and the hip turning that he needed for his position. So you see how important this small structure, the labrum is, to the stability, to the micro stability of the hip. Here's another example of a football rotatory injury with the knee striking the ground. A very similar looking labral tear, not quite as ragged in a younger patient with open physis, capsule is distended, and one sees the zona abicularis as a line drawn between these two interfaces. Everything above it is intraarticular, and the patient also has a large supralateral labral flap tear. An overlooked structure in the hip is the ligamentum teres. The ligamentum teres only carries with it about 10 to 15 percent of the blood supply for the hip. The rest comes from the circumflex femoral arteries 
and their retinacular perforators. And where do they perforate? At the zona abicularis. Here's a normal ligamentum teres. It inserts in the region of the fovea capitis. It arises from the transverse ligament. So it is a ligamentous to ligamentous structure. It has two heads. It has an ischial head in the back and a pubic head in the front. They are not drawn separately here. But this is an example of a rupture of the two heads of the ligamentum teres without involvement of the underlying bone. There's a partial thickness tear. It doesn't involve the entire depth of the ligamentum teres. There's a patient with a fraying type injury where the ligamentum teres may show these small little delicate hairs or it, it may just be wispy or ill-defined or it just may be thin. There's another kind of injury where the ligamentum teres is separated from the femoral head but taken a flake of bone with it. The only clue you'll have is on the PD spur, there'll be some medullary endosteal edema. And here's congenital absence of the ligamentum teres. The only clue here you'll have is the space between the medial aspect of the femur and the lateral aspect of the acetabulum will be wider than you're used to seeing and asymmetric with the other side. It's an example of a patient with a ligamentum teres tear. The patient was sent in with groin pain. She's a cheerleader. She also then went on to have pain in the right hip. But let's concentrate on the left side. She was sent in to evaluate for labral tear. She has contrast placed into the joint. There is a normal, smooth, round, shallow sulcus, but no tear but she does not have a ligamentum teres. It's absent. It could be congenitally absent, or it could be torn. Is there a way to differentiate the two? Well, history is an important way. Old films is the best way. Seeing the presence of marrow edema suggesting an avulsion is an important way, or identifying retracted fibers that have fallen into the lower aspect of the joint, and here they are, squirreled up at the base of the femoroacetabular articulation. If you see absolutely no ligamentum teres, then it is most likely congenitally deficient. We'll finish with a fascinating case. Here's a young radiologist's wife in her 40s or early 50s. She's a compulsive exerciser. She uses kettleballs and was in her typical leaning over position using her kettleballs when doing nothing unusual whatsoever. She felt a sudden, inexplicable, severe pain in her hip that radiated into her groin. Here are her findings on the PD spur and the T1. We see her hyaline cartilage, but her acetabulum is completely replaced by higher T1 signal and high PD spur signal. Now, this is what fresh, acute, or hyperacute blood into the labrum looks like. This is an intralabral hemorrhage. It's such an unusual case that I thought you would enjoy seeing it in a vignette. Here it is axially. This is all, not bursitis, not fluid around the labrum, fluid inside the labrum. So through extreme precision of knowing exactly where the labrum should be and not being able to identify it as a normal structure, we have ascertained that blood inside the labrum is the diagnosis and why she has sustained this unusual injury when others have not is still a mystery to us but here it is in the sagittal projection with the labrum maintaining its triangular shape and showing some typical methemoglobin staining as the labral injury was followed over time and here's the ultrasound demonstrating the increased echogenicity and reflectivity of blood 
in the acetabular labrum. So that concludes what is a miscellaneous collection of acute injuries. We started out, though, with a very important one, the hip dislocation. It's commonly missed, especially in children. They go down on the field of contact. They have hip pain, but then they rise up and they walk off the field. And nobody thinks that a hip dislocation, which is a fairly severe injury, could have such an innocuous course in such a short period of time. They go into the scanner where somebody sees a femoral head contusion and misreads this as a solitary fracture or some other abnormality like an osteoid osteoma and they miss the posterior labral tear. This is not the exception, this is the rule. This is the most common scenario that I see and now that you've heard it, I'm hoping you'll never miss it. Thank you and have a great day.